Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be exploring the hidden years of Jesus' life. That's right. We know almost nothing about the majority of the years that Jesus Christ lived on earth. And today, we're going to try to discover what he did during those hidden years. All secrets will be uncovered. Let what is hidden come to light. Excited to cover this topic. Um, it's it's definitely a mystery, so I don't know how much we're gonna uncover. But um, well, they're they're called the hidden years for a reason, yeah, and, and or the lost years. And for someone, I mean, it's God made man. We know almost nothing about the majority of his life, and you would think that the early gospel writers and the apostles would try to find out everything they could, but that didn't happen because back then people really weren't worried about biographies. They were worried about the essence of a person Mm -hmm. and of what someone was saying. Um, And how important infancy narrative is in comparison to adolescent narrative. The infancy narrative carries such weight. And I think that's why there is such great detail as it relates to the birth of Jesus, because Jesus is truly someone great throughout history. I mean, when, when you consider the historical figure of Jesus, you know, we as faithful believers of Jesus, the Son of God, you know, even even in respect to a worldly view of the person of Jesus, Jesus was born on a very, very important day, and that relates to the constellations and the heavens and and how it's documented so well in the Gospels. But, I, you know, I, I recall being in Nazareth, and there's a church of Jesus the Adolescent on top of the mountain overlooking the Church of the Annunciation, and they have a statue of him in his adolescence. And I remember walking around that region and spending time in Nazareth meditating on the mystery of the fact that we really don't know a lot about what Jesus uh, went through or experienced or did in that period of time in his life. Yeah. So you're saying like there's no <clears throat> there's the nothing. Bi- biographical uh, writings and, and that was not an interest to people back in the, the day? The closest thing was the Gospel of Luke. Right. Right. Th- that's the closest thing that we have to like a real accurate sketch of after all of the reviews of yeah. all of the, you know, the testimonies out there, Luke compiled in his own words, he compiled a very accurate and and detailed historical line of what was held to be true for yeah, Jesus. Yeah, tradition says that St. Luke knew Our Lady mm-hmm. um, and would have gotten those details from Mary herself. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, you've got the incarnation, God becoming man. Obviously, that's a very important mm-hmm. thing. And so... Just by way of that event, and and the meaning of that event in in history, uh, covering that obviously is a very important thing to mm-hmm. do theologically, religiously, and then obviously his the the proclamation of the kingdom and, and that beginning. So, you know, I don't know how much he was doing as a child to to save the world, right? <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, so well, just by existing, he was doing everything. Yeah. No. Now, before we get into this episode, why don't you tell everyone where they can find out about our missing years and all the lost episodes that they can go check out. Yeah, and if you're just joining us on the Catholic Talk Show and being a part of our family, say you've recently subscribed on all of our platforms, whether it's audio, whether it's visual. If you're on YouTube, make sure you're clicking that subscribe button. But, you know, you may have missed a lot of our shows. We've been doing this for over, what, two and a half years? Three now? years, yeah, about three years now. And it's been a joy and a ministry that it's we... It's been all right. Yeah, it's been yeah, it's all right. It's all right company's okay. Beat the stick in the but eye. the material's awesome. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just catch up on the hidden years. Go to catholictalkshow.com. There you'll see all of our videos, all of our transmissions from the very beginning. And there's also cool show notes as- associated with every single show. And you can only access that through our webpage. But like I said, we're on YouTube. We're on iTunes. We're on Spotify. We're on all of the podcasting forums. We're syndicated through Catholic TV. A big shout out to them. And we just love being able to do what we do. But we wouldn't be able to do that without the financial support of our patrons. If you're considering being a financial supporter of the show, go to patreon.com forward slash Catholic Talk Show. You'll see every way that you could support us. If you go to our website, you could go to the website hashtag or excuse me, back, back forward slash uh, backslash. There we go. Not hashtag, but backslash. <laughs> 
uh, Patreon, you'll see all of the cool tiers as well. So forward slash forward slash. It's not backslash. Yeah, you know nothing of URLs. Yeah, what am I gonna do? He's a priest. He doesn't even know this stuff. But something I do know is that if you're following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, you're gonna get some great content as well. Thank you for joining for the show, and let's break open the hidden years of Jesus. All right. So the hidden years of Jesus really encompass the years of our Lord's life between the ages of twelve and thirty. That's the majority of his life on earth, and we know nothing about it. I mean, we know about, we hear about the uh, infancy narrative. We know about his birth. We know about the flight to Egypt. We, and then we know about Mary and Joseph losing Jesus at the temple, right? Yeah, that kind of fast forwards to that, 12 years old, that, and it's just one event. That's one event. Yeah. And we then know, what happens after that? Nothing. Like, mm -hmm. The Bible is actually... Nothing happens. He just went home and mm -hmm. he sat there. Well, the Bible <laughs> that says, you know, Luke 2, 52, and Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and favor before God and man. That's it. It's like, okay, we'll catch you when you start in your ministry, you well, know, 20 years from now. Yeah, I mean, you just have to look at, uh, you know, the Jewish culture and how, how they were raised. Obviously, we know Joseph was a carpenter and... Jesus more than likely became a carpenter under his. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll, and we'll and get those, into that a little bit too. Yeah, and know. those are those are some beautiful meditations to to yeah. have the sense of the yeah. earthly father of Joseph. And you know, I did that forty four day consecration and really developed a sense of what Jesus experienced throughout his adolescent years and developing that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but it, like I mentioned, and we've mentioned so many times, it's it's good to open up the catechism. Mm -hmm. What does the catechism say about the hidden years of Jesus? Because this is well contextualized, articulated throughout many generations and centuries. It is literally called the hidden years of Jesus. So in, catech in, ca in the Catechism 534, it expresses the finding of Jesus in the temple is the only event that breaks the silence of the Gospels about the hidden years of Jesus, which we've just mentioned. Here Jesus lets us catch a glimpse of the mystery of his total consecration to a mission that flows from his divine sonship. Quote, did you not know that I must be about my father's work? End quote. Mary and Joseph did not understand these words, but they accepted them in faith. Mary, quote, kept all these things in her heart. During the years, Jesus remained hidden in the silence of an ordinary life. So the catechism shares that sense of an ordinary life, an ordinary life related to the family life of Nazareth, which I appreciate the most because when we think about how God has, you know, uh, ordered civility, how God has ordered civilization, he has based it upon the institution of the human family. And when you, when you think of that importance and the dignity of the human family, wouldn't God, who became man, enter into a human family if that institution holds the greatest value right. in civility? So, I, you know, I, I do like the, the catechism where we're starting, but I'm also excited about getting into more of the Gnostic treatments, things that have happened over the years where people, you know, whether it's through conjecture, whether it's through meditation, mystical prayer, they yeah. start to develop these different uh, experiences or, 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 you know, they try to fill uh, in the stories. Gaps. They try to fill yeah. in the gaps yeah. with meditation mm -hmm. in the same way that I was walking around Nazareth and really meditating on, oh, Jesus walked around these streets yeah. and what they, would he have seen or done? I think we've talked about this statue before, but at, at the, uh, Our, Our Lady Queen of the Universe in Orlando, it's a shrine. If you're ever in Orlando at Disney World It's a basilica, whatever, yeah. It's a basilica mm -hmm. shrine. It's there right on the freeway as you're heading to Disney World. beautiful statue yeah. of Joseph looking at baby Jesus, like, not baby Jesus, but a, a young Jesus. Toddler Jesus. Holding, like, a, um, you know, a T-square or a hammer or something like that, and it just his gaze upon him. So, like, Joseph still also pondered things in his heart, mm -hmm. too, as well. You know, mm -hmm. Mary did, but... You know, you look at the way he's gazing at Jesus and you just see in his eyes. It's just a very beautiful meditation mm -hmm. on, on Joseph, too. That's as well. beautiful. Yeah, yeah and I, I love what the catechism says, the silence of an ordinary life. Because our Lord's ministry and his ultimately his, his sacrifice and resurrection, these are tumultuous and momentous occurrences. And it, it's comforting to me to know that Jesus got the opportunity to have a sweet, yeah. silent, calm ordinary life with his mom, with Joseph, working, knowing people, eating, enjoying particular foods, having hobbies, right? It's yeah. good to know that, to consider that because Jesus is truly man. And there's a lot of times the, the tendency to overemphasize one part of his nature or the other. You know, sometimes oh, he's just a man, he's a good teacher, or he's God throwing lightning bolts like Zeus. 
he's God and man. And you can't fully understand the nature of Christ without really understanding that interplay. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's, it's great to consider that he had that, that he, Mm -hmm. he had his room, he had a bed, you know, he grew up, he probably played sports with his friends. He probably played games, right? Mm -hmm. It's good to know that he got that sweet life. And, yeah. you know, what's associated with that is humility. Mm-hmm. Look at God's humility in the incarnation alone. Yeah. Right? Like, that. that's pretty impressive sense of... of the hum- passion, too. Yeah. The passion. The, and, and his passion directs him to humility. Yep. You know, like that he took the form of a slave, um, you know, being like us in all things. So Jesus in the earthly family, in the human family, is an act of humility. Jesus in his adolescence and in his childhood, you know, enjoying the simplicity of ordinary life is an act of humility, but it also reveals to us the beauty of our of our human lives um, and that we should be ordered towards simplicity. That's one of the vows that diocesan priests take, or promises, really. Mm-hmm. A, a promise that a diocesan priest takes is simplicity. Well, the simplicity of life in, in the religious life is, is something that would be associated with what Jesus lived out in the ordinary life. You know, there's a quote by Chesterton that I love, and I've mentioned it a few times, but uh, he said, the most extraordinary thing in the world is an ordinary man, his ordinary wife, and their ordinary children. Now, Jesus was no ordinary child, mm-hmm. but you get the sentiment that it's the most extraordinary thing is the is the calm, ordinary life. Yeah, now, I think a lot of people's anxiety in the world is is kind of stretched into the projection of what life should be, right, with movies and <sighs> news False and expectations. That. Yeah, it's just... You know, it, it, it strikes against the ordinary life, mm-hmm. you know. It, it plays into what is most base in the human person in respect to, uh, uh, you know, attacking or drawing or alluring that covetous spirit, yeah. you know. And and that's certainly not what's happening within the in the holy home of Nazareth and in, in the holy family. Yeah. And and you could ex- you could expect that in the immaculate conception and the, the, you know, the woman without stain uh, in relationship to Joseph, who is the just man and Jesus, who is the son of God in that household, there was great harmony and unity, concord, peace. Peace. And of course, Jesus, when he enters into his public ministry, he is going to be necessarily um, a movement of that reality in the world because it comes from the premise of the ordinary life. Mm-hmm. And and that is how ordinary life sh- ought to be live, lived out. So the missing years encompass the years from 12 to 30. Why would those years be missing? And I think there's some important clues to understand from Jewish culture, especially at the time, of why those years would be the ones that are not documented. So at 12 years old, that's the last thing that we hear of Jesus until he begins his ministry at 29 or 30, 30, but it was 30. Um, okay, so what happens at 13 in Jewish culture? Bar mitzvah. There you go. And that's the age of maturity in, in yep. society. Okay, so we know, okay, now he's mature. So it's that's the leaving off point. Then what happens at 30? Well, at 30 years old, that is was considered when a person was of age to be eligible for the priesthood, <coughs> right? In the Levitic priesthood, you could not be a priest until you were 30 years old. That was the age of wisdom, essentially. So from the age of the bar mitzvah to the age where you can be a priest, those are the years that are missing. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence. But he wasn't a religious priest. He was not He was not a Levitical priest. Or even trained up to be a rabbi. I mean, because well, that's the, training, we'll, right? We'll get into that. Yeah. But I think it, it follows him following the law that you really couldn't become that um, right, the, the, a rabbi, yeah, because he was Jewish, too. right? And he practiced. He practiced law. So yeah. there's there's rhyme and reason, the rhyme and reason as to why between twelve and thirty are missing. So that's mm-hmm. probably the reason. Mm. And it leaves a lot of space for Jesus in his adult nature mm-hmm. to go out into a world to experience firsthand the divisive powers of politics and the distinctions between governments and nations and bloodshed yeah. and violence and political strife. He must have had that experience firsthand. And the need of humanity is what is responded to in the essence of priesthood. Mm-hmm. Wherever there is a human labor or a human amount of suffering, there in that injustice, 
the priesthood is there. Mm -hmm. So Ryan, you mentioned that he was a carpenter, and, and let's unpack that a little bit. So he would have been working you know, essentially as an apprentice under Joseph, but what does a carpenter mean in the time and place? I mean, he's not Bob Vila. They're not making <laughs> chairs and stuff like that, right? It's not the same. <laughs> and the word that's used in Greek is tecton, mm -hmm. okay? And a lot of times that could be rendered as carpenter, but also kind of as a... Merchant, right? No, almost like a handyman okay. or a laborer, mm -hmm. okay? So the word, the word tecton has a lot of different meanings. Now, um, Nazareth was a small town, yeah, okay? So, I mean, Nazareth, if it had maybe 800 people, it would have been surprising, right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to find employment when you have, you know... 30 buildings and right. you're building buildings and you're building carpentry stuff. What are you going to do? Where is, where's your, Not where's your clientele? Fix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at the time there was a really large new city being built. <clears throat> so the area was generally known as the Decapolis, 10 cities, right? And the, the Romans were funding the development of a huge new city called Sephoris. Hmm. Sephoris is a couple kilometers North of Nazareth. Jesus probably would have been working there. He was probably a commuter, yeah. right? Every day he'd probably t walk a couple kilometers up to Sephoris and work there because that's where all the activity was happening. If you were a laborer, that's where the job was. Mm -hmm. So to consider that Jesus had a commute next time you're in your car and you have to drive downtown to go to your job and you're not liking it, Jesus probably did the same thing, right? But he so, was on foot or on a donkey. On a donkey or on a foot, yeah. 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 So techne, techne from the Greek means like craftsman, like something like related to a craft right. so that you would be a skilled person in whatever craft that you were undertaking. Um, and, you know, I, I, when you said that, it was like my mind went all the way back to the major seminary when I first started looking at, uh, at what this Greek term uh, means. But at the very an at artisan. the very depth of it is like it, it's an artistic expression of excellence like it's an it's an art mm -hmm. you know it's an art so that that Jesus would have developed a sense of artistry you know that that Jesus would a have real developed competence. yeah exactly you know that it's it's a beautiful thing to reflect on but it's associated to the scriptures too mm -hmm. so you know when when Jesus you know goes back to Nazareth and you know he's interacting with the people that he has grown up with, essentially, and they're looking at him, and it's like, who is who is this guy? This is the son of the carpenter. This is the son of this this guy who had that that technical ability of of carpentry. Mm -hmm. You know, who is he to come back and speak to us in this manner? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. Sephoris was about a little under four miles from Nazareth. So, so Sephoris, is, is that city or town still in existence? It was an important city throughout the Middle Ages. Okay. Um, then after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the, all, of, all of the Holy Land was pretty much not populated much, and there's like 400, 500 people there until like the 30s, but now it's completely abandoned. Okay. But yeah, it was a really important city at the time, so... Jesus is probably walking four miles every morning uphill and downhill mm. on the way home to work, mm. you know, yeah, uh, to go work. So he was going there. Now, he could have been working as, uh, you know, cutting, you know, using the stones. He could have been doing the wood. It could have been all those things. Mm -hmm. Kind of, I don't want to say just a construction worker, but generally that sense. When you hear carpenter, a lot of times you think that he was whittling, you know, rocking horses and stuff like that. Yeah is more intense, more manly than that. I mean, he was a, I would say, based on what my conjecture is, essentially a construction worker who was capable of a lot of things. Because if you've ever known a construction worker, they can hang drywall, they can, yeah. they can, you know, do the wood, they can mess with cement, they can do the insulation, they can do the roof. They know how to do all that. And he's That's young kind of, and strong, right? You know what I mean? So, I mean, he, he had to be a strong young man to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, lifting stuff, like, you know, building stuff. I mean, it's... And I, and I love I love that about Jesus because he shows the dignity of human labor and how important human labor is to society and civilization at large. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, I, you know, I would rather, um, you know, mm -hmm. worship a savior that rolled up his sleeves and yeah. worked in that manner as opposed to entering into the political life and trying to maneuver the politics of the world, 
and and kind of be like uh, you know inheriting this type of a position yeah. uh, in line of, of Judaism. It also speaks to, and I said this before, and the passion I've watched that you know this past year I haven't seen it in years. The the strength that it that it took for him to endure his passion, mm-hmm. right? Like this this was not you know ow oh I mean this was like a tough mm-hmm. guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, yes, there is the 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 the, the divinity of, of God, but the humanity, it what it and what he endured, what his humanity endured was was very very rigorous. Mm-hmm. You know, he had to be a very strong man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the fact that Simon of Cyrene would carry the weight of the cross and and burden that weight shows Jesus carried the fullness of that weight. Right. In, in Calvary, you know, you know we, we by did, himself. We did an episode on, on the crucifix a we couple did. episodes back, and we we kind of did the French scientists' yeah. conjecture as to how much the cross weighed. And someone mm-hmm. made a comment, and it kind of really stuck out. And it's like, no one knows how much the cross weighs because it carried with it the weight of every sin. Mm. And I was like... That's phenomenal. That's beautiful. Yeah, I, I felt corrected, that's and beautiful. I felt put in my place. It was a great comment. That's beautiful. So shout out to that comment. Yeah, there. that's an excellent comment because... We're talking about a, a spiritual, mm-hmm. emotional weight, yeah. you know, after being abandoned right. by his his loved ones, mm-hmm. you know, his his apostles, you know, but you, you just like specifically about the cross, though, like the density of the wood of that time and like the weight of the wood in comparison yeah. to going up to Home Depot and yeah. picking up a two by four. Like there's just no, yeah, no <clears throat> there's comparison. no comparison. So like the construction materials that Jesus worked with with his hands and what his ability was to move the, the heaviest density. Yeah, the yeah. density of that wood, the de- that stone, moving that stone, you know, it, most definitely, you know, the the man, you know, Jesus Christ in his humanity was very, very strong man. Mm-hmm. So Jesus was, you know, construction worker, carpenter, working quietly, learning under Joseph, going home at night, having dinner, sleeping, he had his own bed, you know. I mean, that's really kind of powerful to consider that the mm-hmm. majority of the most important lifespan was so silent, so quiet. Mm-hmm. And that sparks people's imaginations, mm-hmm. yeah. right? You take anybody, you t- <laughs> you take any historical figure and they take these missing gaps and they start to conjecture, right? Yeah. It's like fan fiction. Mm-hmm. A lot of fan fiction essentially arose around these hidden years because it's it's so alluring. It's a, it's a, it's a historical and narrative vacuum and something needs to fill that in people's minds. Mm-hmm. So but where, where do you go from Luke... Chapter 2, verse 52, 52, where it says, Jesus, quote, advanced in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man mm-hmm. after the period of the 12, after being 12 years old. I mean, you can go any, you can go any direction. You can go any direction. Well, what does stature mean? I mean, mm-hmm. stature means in, in his faith, in <clears throat> the synagogues. I mean, like, Maybe in correlation with, with the people that he's he's working yeah, with. people like, hey, this is, a good, this is a good guy, right? Yeah. Um, so people fill this gap in with all sorts of theories, you know, and these are ancient theories. A lot of these go back to second and third century, right? These are not things that were created 100 years ago. Mm-hmm. So there's things like the uh, infancy narrative of Thomas, mm-hmm. the uh, proto-gospel of Matthew. There's uh, a Syriac gospel, too. And they try to fill in a lot of this. And there's a lot of really interesting stories, Gnostic stories, things that are just kind of like off the wall where they're trying to give color to these missing years. Mm-hmm. But it's also re- relative to, you know, okay, I can see why this narrative didn't make it into the canon. Right. As well. You the, know, but these I, smell very much of made up fan oh, fiction. Yeah. Is it just, like almost like Gnosticism? Like, hey, I know what it was. I, I think and a I lot need, of them are. I deserve credit mm-hmm, for it type. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I think the infancy gospel of Thomas was actually developed by the Gnostics. Yeah. You know? I mean, that would that would seem like uh, something that would draw their mm-hmm. attention. Absolutely. Right? Privileged yeah. knowledge. And you could yeah. see that in different circles, even in in Catholic oh, yeah. circles today, oh, yeah. Yeah. where it's just like this private revelation yeah. is, is the revelation that now we finally have this type of understanding or perspective, and this makes us superior mm-hmm. to all other types of religious groups or all other types of of Catholics. devotions yeah. and Catholics, yeah. and that is treacherous to the unity and the yeah. fabric of Catholicos. That is that is that is treacherous to our unity. You know, we have to 
truly honor the canon, we have to truly honor our tradition, it doesn't mean that private revelation doesn't have a place. It absolutely does. I'm the first one to, to cry out divine mercy of St. Faustina. First yeah. one, you know? But it's all in the context of our greater practice in our universality. We have to be clear on that. Mm-hmm. So let's let's jump into some of these, uh, you know, for especially the Gospel of St. Thomas. <coughs> I think there's some really interesting uh, stories of that. Now, in- take these all narrative. with a grain or a con- and tell your salt lack of salt because these are from a Gnostic gospel and they are most likely no they are made up. <laughs> they are, these, these are Let's made up. Let's face it. Let's just face it. Let's just face but it. But there's a lot of stories and I think it tells you what people were considering Jesus at the time, right? Of what they would have conjectured based on mm-hmm. their historical closeness and time to them and their understanding. So there's stories where Jesus would be playing as a kid and he'd take clay and he'd make a bird shape out of it, right? It's like fashioned into a little bird, and then he'd breathe on it, and the bird it would turn into a bird and fly away. Mm-hmm. Right? There's stories, um, and that's that's Jesus that was the Gospel wizard. of Thomas. This then is that's an Arabic, it, yeah. Well, that, that's Jesus it. the wizard. And it, 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 listen to this so, uh, at age of seven, this is from an Arabic infancy gospel, reference 36. At age of seven, Jesus playing with his friends made different animals of clay. Jesus then told these figures to walk, some to fly, and some to eat from his hand. So it's drawing from the Gospel of St. Thomas, too, mm-hmm. this Gnostic Gospel. The other boys told this to their parents who told them not to play with Jesus because he's a wizard. <laughs> and, and that's what they were saying at the time. Jesus the wizard. Another one, this is an Irish versified narrative of reference 11 through 21. Listen to this. A boy annoyed Jesus. <laughs> The boy collapsed. He died on the instant. (laughs) Jesus responded to Joseph, anyone who is innocent does not die from judgment. It is only the wicked that the curse pursues. (laughs) Oh, jeez. Lightning why bolts. didn't why didn't that make it into the canon shield? <laughs> right, because it's <laughs> Ow, shenanigans. Shoot fireballs out of my fingers. <laughs> Jesus in the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, all of these, a lot of these stories, like whether Jesus will, a lot of these stories in these Gnostic gospels paint Jesus as a petulant child learning to control his powers. Right. Yeah. He and Joseph. You know, you know there are a lot of them. The local people will go to Joseph and be like, hey, man, get your boy together. He's, you know, smiting everybody. That's right? kind of like the house in X-Men, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you can see that they're, they're showing, they're trying to portray Jesus as trying to harness his powers, trying yeah. to understand them. And they are treating him like a wizard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they don't capture the beauty of his humility yeah, and, the, right. and the purity of his heart. Listen to this one, the gospel, infancy of Gospel of Thomas, reference uh, B6 through 7. Joseph led him to a certain teacher named Zacchaeus and said, take this child and teach him letters. And when Jesus heard, he laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> you say what things you know, but I understand more things than you know. For before the ages I am... Behold, you do not believe me now. When you see my cross, then you will believe that I speak the truth. Hey, they're making Jesus sound like a jerky little kid. Yeah, he wasn't. And he wasn't. Um, there, there's one that I like, and, and, and I like this one because it sounds maybe the most plausible of all these infancy stories that Mary asked Jesus to go get water from the well, and the pitcher was broken. So Jesus just took off his cloak, filled it with water, and brought it back without the water seeping through the garment. Okay, that one, that seems like a... A useful use uh, of your powers. Yeah, I was about to say, it has purpose. Like, I think... Serving mom. A good analogy is if you've ever seen, like, Superman movies where Mary or Martha, yeah. Martha and, you know, the Kent yep. are trying to teach Superman, hey, man, you can't just go and win every race and, you know, crush people on the football field. You need to, like, use your powers without hurting people. A little more prudence. Right. So there's, I think, honestly, there's a lot of parallels between that, you know, those Superman when he's a kid in Kansas and then this. Now, none of this is true, but it's interesting to even ponder, did Jesus use his powers as a kid? Well, he would have to exact his power, whatever we're calling power, in union with the Father. Right. right? It couldn't be on his own, right? Right. So you have to, like, ponder that as Mm -hmm. well, right? So so it's not going to be him independently 
sort of making decisions about how to use his power, it's going to be literally it's in to union. glorify the Father. It's, it's literally in union with God the Father. That's a great point. You know, so so he's not going to go around zapping things, and, right, and making birds fly out right. of clay. And <laughs> it would be it would also be in accordance with uh, humility. Right, that, that's and, it and too. That's, that's, that's the, the most important yeah. thing, bro. It's like, hidden. It's hidden. Right, and and that is another facet of humility. I like that. I yeah. like that relationship. And from Luke chapter two, beginning at forty one on, we've touched on this already. But this is the boy Jesus in the temple. So this is this is in his adolescence. He's twelve years old. You know, we all know the we all know that reflection from uh, the joyful mysteries. You know, um, this is also the first recorded words of Jesus. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, how many people that, yeah. consider that the what first? Is- the first recorded when he's talking words to the Jesus. to the teachers and the elders in the temple, oh. this is the first thing yeah. in history recorded of Jesus saying. This is the initial words of the logos when he when he talks to Mary. in his in, our, in his incarnation. No. And, and why don't we why don't we just read like it. read through? Yeah, it. because this is you know we'll read through every verse. I was just going to yeah. reference something small, but why not? Um, starting with verse forty one. Each year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, and when he was twelve years old, they went up according to festival custom. After they had completed its days, as they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Thinking that he was in the caravan, they journeyed for a day and looked for him among their relatives and acquaintances, but not finding him, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Asking them questions? That's, you know, come on. Yeah. Um, th- th- that has a different delivery than what we're reading in these Gnostic, uh, Gnostic Gospels. Yeah, than a bratty wizard. Exactly, yeah. a bratty wizard. <laughs> the bratty wizard would have been like, you know, shaking oh, his yeah. finger. <laughs> and all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. So it's almost as if he's, he's asking questions in the depth of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, in perfect communion with the Father, he's asking these questions that are leading to these deep pooled reservoirs of of insight and knowledge from God. And they're all marveling and astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been looking for you with great anxiety. And he said to them, and this is what I love. This is These his are first the first words. words. This, oh my gosh, I got goosebumps. I've never considered his first, first Neither words. Neither have I until you brought that up. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? First thing Jesus ever recorded is saying is, why were you looking for me? It's a question. It's a statement. And, and think it's, of and that it's a question depth. to yourself. Yeah, like, like think of that. Depth. That's awesome. You are you are goosebumped up. Why were you looking for me? Yeah, yeah, think of the depth of the questions that we were just thinking about with all of these, you know, uh, scribes and and people of wisdom within the temple. He's asking questions, and then he begins his first literal statement in scripture. Why were you looking for me? Another question. Another question. Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? So he was just throwing questions out. Well, and he's talking, giving answers too. They said he was amazed by the people were amazed by his answers. Yeah, so he's having this dialogue. He's learning. He's comporting himself like a very wise elder, almost talking to these theological masters. It would be like I, it'd be like Joe going up and talking to you know Joseph Ratzinger and Scott Hahn and Bishop Barron, and they're like, "Wow, this kid's blowing us away. That's amazing." I mean, I look at it from a parent's perspective, like, dude, like, shouldn't you tell your parents you're doing this? You know what I mean? Well, like, that's what I Mary said. Why would you do this to us? Yeah. And, and that's how she started. But then verse 50, after this account of what Jesus is, says, the verse says, but they did not understand what he said to them. I still don't. Yeah. And, and that's a, <laughs> it's a mystery. It's like, what are you talking about? It's, you, all you had to do is tell us you were going to be here. Yeah. <laughs> we would have waited for you. Come on. <laughs> but, but this no, is no goosebumps. But this <laughs> is, this is where, this is where the purity, no goosebumps here. No goosebumps here. Yeah. And I get them. I've got blood rushing <laughs> in my head right now. Jesus. <laughs> so, but then this next verse, this is what shows the perfection of Mary as mother, mm-hmm. literal mother of the Son of God, realizing the communion that she has as spouse of the Holy Spirit, birthed the Son of God. He went down with them and came to Nazareth, was obedient to them, 
and his mother kept all these things in her heart. So his, his obedience, culturally, identity-wise, his obedience is to the father. But yeah. he subjugated but, himself to his human correct. parents. But he, yeah, he's exactly. So he made himself subject, and we, you know, we think there's of, more humility. In yeah, that, there's you know? even more humility. More Once humility. again, it's showing the person of Jesus Christ in his adolescence, taking on such forms of humility that's never been accomplished in perfection before. He's perfectly humble. Yeah, and. And it's not that the accounts of his interactions with the scribes or the account of him interacting with Mary and Joseph was coming from a snide position of confidence where I'm in my father's house. Wouldn't you think I'd be in my father's house? It's not that. Like, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? I must be mm-hmm. yeah. in my father's you house. Know, here's it's, a another, point. it's another thing, too, because he was 12. It's before the bar mitzvah. Yeah. And and the cultural, you know, cachet thing. that the carries, right? Right, but but it's also maybe a, a, from a human development standpoint, a a, a a big deal for him to realize this that that the father would carry him there to do that. Mm-hmm. You know that that this might be his coming of age in terms of a, a, an adolescent yeah. as well. Now, I think something else in that verse that really strikes me is that he was obedient to them. Now, everyone's always like, well, why Why do you pray to Mary? She's just a woman. You know, she wasn't, you know, blah, 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 the Protestant kind of line on Mary. If Jesus could be obedient, I'll be obedient. Jesus is obedient (laughs) to Mary. Think of that when you think Mary can't, you know, Mm -hmm. Mary can't intercede for you. If Jesus in scripture is obedient to Mary and you ask Mary, Mary, can you pray for me to your son? Because I'm a scumbag. I don't want to go right to Jesus. Or can you please pray for me? Yeah. Mary, Jesus is, was obedient to Mary. So if Mary asks something of Jesus, he will give it. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. the root of our intercession through Mary. Mm-hmm. Now, those are the things that we kind of know. And we talked about some of those infancy gospels. Let's talk about some of the theories of where Jesus would have went in maybe his late teens and his 20s, right? Because, you know, we're talking about Jesus as a young kid, but then Jesus was 15 years old. You know, he had a probably started growing a little mustache, you know, had a tiny, bad teenage mustache, right? Probably zits. Zits, right? <laughs> you know, then he's 18 years old. Poor he's kinda... Jesus, little teenage Jesus suffered <laughs> zits, and he had no Neutrogena, Ryan. <laughs> He had to go to Sephora's for the Neutrogena. <laughs> <laughs> it was a four-mile walk. Yeah. He right? put mud on his face and then pointed at his that, fingers that, and all the like, zits like were it. gone. That was uh-huh. another Gnostic, uh, you know, marketing scheme. Of, um. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, yeah, you the look Dead at... Dead Sea mud. Dead Sea salt scrub. I love it. But between, eight, you know, now he's 18, 22, 24, 25. I mean, he's 25 years old. You're a grown man. Yeah. Right? Now what are yeah, you doing? Why 30? That's why well, I Well, we, we already talked about that. We talked yeah. about at 30 was the age where of you wisdom. Were, of, of wisdom, where you could be a qualified for a Levitical yeah. priest. Gotcha. Okay. Mm-hmm. Keep up, Ryan. Leave I'm trying. <laughs> no goosebumps. No All goosebumps. he's thinking about is Neutrogena and no <laughs> zits. But everyone wants to say Jesus went to their country, right, during these missing years. There's, it's kind of a way of say, hey, my country's important, so important that Jesus went there. Mm-hmm. So there's theories or rumors or kind of myths of Jesus traveling all over the world. Some people say he went to Tibet. Some people say he traveled all the way to Japan and learned Taoism. Some people will say... Yeah, he that, studied Buddhism. The Buddhism. Um, there's a place in, in Japan that claims to have... To be the burial site of Jesus because he went there, learned, did his stuff in Israel, went back and had a family and died. Like everyone wants to claim Jesus as their own, but as a man, not as man and God. Um, India. India. There's a big tradition of him going to India with. Um, Thomas? With the, with the, well, they said, well, why would they go to India? That wasn't really in the sphere. Well, Jesus had a soft spot in his heart for India, so that's why Thomas went there, right? Um, one of the big theories in the Middle Ages, or one of the big traditions, was that he went to England. And this is because he was a relative of Joseph of Arimathea. And now, we know Joseph of Arimathea was very rich, right? Yeah. Well, according to tradition, he was a tin trader, right? He would get tin um, and trade it back and forth between England. And England at this time was just coming under the dominion of Rome, so it's now within the empire. Mm-hmm. Joseph of Arimathea gets very rich trading this really rare 
right. commodity. And Jesus, according to this tradition, went with Joseph of Arimathea multiple times to England. That's plausible. Plausible? I, I, I doubt it. I doubt it, too. I doubt it. I mean, th there's no reason to believe that. But that was one of the deep traditions. Um, and that's why they say that the, when Joseph of Arimathea took the Holy Grail after the crucifixion, he took it back to England. That's why there's that whole tradition of... You know, Arthurian grail legend centered around Avalon, right? Because Jesus kind of consecrated the place. Even, even in relative literary history in 2002, there was an American writer, Christopher Moore, who published a book. Well, you know, Christopher Less. And, and, and he wanted to enter into the hidden years of Jesus and the lost years in his adolescence uh, through the through the eyes of Jesus's childhood pal, and he, he entitled the book "Lamb: The Gospel According to Biff." <laughs> <laughs> Jesus' best Christ's friend was childhood Biff. Childhood pal. Back to the Future. <laughs> right. Hey man, I'd, I Biff. wish I had exactly. That's what I'm saying. Back to the Future. I Wait. don't know if I'd want to be a friend of Biff. <laughs> He's a bad dude. <laughs> He's a bad dude. But if anybody's gonna convert Biff, it would be Jesus. <laughs> Well, we uh, all know how that story ended. <laughs> oh, man. Jesus, yeah. Uh, um, with the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> Biff needs Jesus. He does. That was, Speaking of needing Jesus. Yes. Biff. You need to get hollow if you need Jesus. That you is do. a very good point. Yeah. Yes. It's an app. Biff needs hollow. See, yeah. I don't know if Biff should have hollow because Biff will be on hollow on his phone. He'll be driving around in his, you know, his old 50s car, and he'll be looking at hollow, his side swipe, a manure truck, and it's all over, right? <laughs> oh, good point. Not a good idea for Biff, no. but a great idea for you. That's Very right. good idea for you. So yeah. if you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow, it's not backslash, it's forward, forward slash. slash. Forward slash hollow. Dude, it's 2021, and you don't know how internet works. Well, oh let gosh. me tell you what I do know is that hollow is free for our Catholic Talk Show family. So you want to definitely check out the website Download Hallow. There are phenomenal offerings within Catholic tradition of prayer and meditation and contemplation. There's incredible, you know, features including Jonathan Rumi reading you beautiful stories and meditations, leading you to kind of calm down in the evening and wisp off into rest, rest, rest. yeah, which is phenomenal. But Lexio Divina, Divina music podcast. I mean, it's amazing. why isn't our podcast in there? We need to talk to them. Maybe you have included a podcast in it. Hello, guys. Alex, <laughs> Alessandro. I thought we were partners. I thought there was this mutual well, love. And, and I think it's because he's no Father Mike Schmidt. That's right. what it is. But there is Father Mike Schmitz on that app. And right. he does Bible in a year. If it was me, it would be Bible in like 10 years. And I mean, I don't think I'd ever get through it. If it was you, it would be like ABCs with Dr. Seuss in five years. It's, it, it's, That's right. I, you know, now I kind of understand why we're not on there. It's okay. Yeah. Guys, you don't have to call us. We get it. It's cool. Yeah. It's cool. <laughs> but it's we cool. still love you, okay? But you know what? People who are listening, what you should do, catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow. Try the app for free to get all the premium features. Yeah. Um, number one Catholic Amazing. app for a reason. Now, a lot of people in their teenage years get kind of, they have their own lost years. They don't know what they want to do when they grow up. They don't know who they want to be. They need a vocation. Right, they need to dis discern what their life is going to be like. Right, and, and we're when we're talking about techne, you yeah. know, to develop a skill a and skill, an artistry, craft, and a yeah. vocation, craft and, a vo and a vocation. Now, Jesus found that in the holy house of Nazareth under Joseph. Now, unfortunately, we can't all learn at the feet of Joseph, but there is somewhere that we can go to learn. You know where that is, Ryan? At the feet of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Where's that? Where can we do that? I need to Ave know this. Ave Maria. Florida. No. Ave Maria Tell University. Tell me more. From the Latin words Ave Maria, meaning Hail Mary yeah. at the Annunciation. I didn't know such a place existed. Oh, it is the number one <laughs> Catholic university oh, I have in to the hear, world. I have to hear about this. Tell me more. Well, there's at least 40 undergrad degrees. How did incredible you get into master's Ave program. Maria? I, they were merciful. <laughs> <laughs> they were merciful. So, hey, look, if your kids don't have great grades... They might still get in there. I mean, look at this kid. No. Hello. <laughs> Ding. <laughs> no, Ave Maria is an amazing university, and um, there are there are sponsors there for a reason. Number one, Father Rich is an alumni, right? Yep. He found his vocation there. Now, That's right. not every vocation. A lot of kids hear vocation, they think, "Oh, I don't want to be a priest or a nun." That's not what vocation means solely. Vocation means your calling. What are you going to be? You're being summoned to do the work of God. Right. So that could be any of their programs that they have. You know biology, business, mm -hmm. um, 
all kinds of amazing majors, nursing, medical, health care, um, but education. But you do it in, a, in the Catholic tradition of discernment, there through you go. prayer, fraternity with mm-hmm. your brothers, your sisters. On a great, beautiful campus in yeah. sunny, beautiful Florida, Ave mm-hmm. Maria, Florida, yeah. just outside of Naples. You're close Short to the drive beach. to the beach. Yeah. Short yeah. drive to the Everglades, which is an international site of Their beauty. Their campus is so cool, too. I mean, these buildings look like Frank Lloyd Wright buildings. Mm-hmm. I mean, they got the beautiful church there. They have 24-hour adoration. Look, if you or one of your children are looking for a place to go to an excellent college that prepares them spiritually and prepares them for success in whatever career they have, Ave Maria is a place where your children or yourself can find that vocation, find that calling in life. So go to AveMaria.edu to learn more now. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the love for Ave Maria. It's It's a place that I absolutely love. And I truly love talking about the hidden years of Jesus. This has been an awesome episode. Yeah. You know, as we're as we're kind of looking at other components to this, you know, I, I think I think it's really important to see that, you know, even this local, you know, this this most recent, uh, you know, book or a, a movie about Jesus's travels through India in 2008 was produced. It, you know, we should never limit our own. Uh, curiosity and the adventure of the imagination within prayer to be able to develop a sense of what did Jesus do Mm -hmm. with his conference, the people he grew up with, other kids that he grew up with in his teenagers, what he did in his 20s. You know, I love reflecting on him going out into the world in his 20s. Me and Dylan Cross lost years in our 20s. I mean, for (laughs) sure. They're lost for a reason. It's mostly a fog. We don't want to dig them back up. Yeah, it's mostly (laughs) a fog and haze of, you know, substance. Yeah. Um, but with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the archaeological world really kind of got turned on, it head, on its head because there was so much more understanding of that time than ever before. So, it was like re- a time capsule, right? Yeah. You know, preservation. So a lot of the writings sounded very Christian. You know, a lot of them were Christian. Uh, so there was a lot of conjecture that Jesus actually had trained or studied with the Essenes, who produced the these Essenes, docu- yeah. Essenes mm-hmm. who had produced these documents. So. A lot of that was kind of the thought that, hey, maybe Jesus started to prepare himself for his ministry with the Essenes. Mm-hmm. Um, but then if you look at his writings, it's probably more likely, and especially with his interactions with the Pharisees, that he probably had more of a uh, pharisaical training, right? More within that tradition, okay? Mm-hmm. That, that That's kind of the vein of preaching that he developed. And I think, I think he would, uh, I, I like that, the sense of vein of preaching. I like the fact that Jesus was nomadic in respect to, it's, there's a great distance between Nazareth yeah. and the tradition where Jesus would have been baptized mm-hmm. yeah. near the Essene communities that lived near the, yep. the Dead Sea in this very arid region. And, you know, what a wonderful thing to consider that this these Essene, this Essene community was a, a group of men and women living celibacy, living ascetical practices of, of you know, ritually qu- cleansing themselves in the mitzvah, reading through, uh, the you know, the Mikha. prophecies of Isaiah and, and really, you know, anticipating the, the, coming, of the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Christ, the anointed one. And, <clears throat> I, you know... Of course, she like I could see Jesus going down, you know, back through Egypt from his earliest memories, you know, returning by way of Egypt, going out and, and just like traveling how a lot of people through. travel when they get out of college or before they go to yeah. college and right. go on a hitchhiking trip. You it's know, one of the most important rites of becoming. Really, I, I look back at all of my travels that I did throughout my twenties. I cherish those because I've learned so much about the world. And picking up newspapers or talking to people on the street or talking to homeless people or talking to priests or religious or, you know, those were the most important relationships and conversations that I ever had developing my worldview. Like a coming of age. Yeah, of course Jesus would have had that. Another thing to consider here strongly is that God uses land and topography and he was baptized in the lowest point Mm. on earth. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it would kind of be... Uh, a good consideration that the humility and the learning in that low area would be a place that he would go just based on the fact that he was baptized, Mm -hmm. you know, in the Jordan. Mm -hmm. And the depths of depravity in relationship to Sodom and Gomorrah and the, and the wrath of God being in that same region. 
You know, yeah. like it, how amazing. Okay, so Jesus was. A, <laughs> this, we, I think we've decided where he studied. <laughs> that, that, you've, you filled them in the last years. That's right, it, man. Cool. <laughs> See, this is this is the quality content people tune in because it is definitive answers on questions that have perplexed and flummoxed and no people mystery for thousands anymore. of years. I got well, goosebumps. Bill you got, you got finally got <laughs> goosebumps. See, look at that. <laughs> So how does Jesus come out of these hidden years? Where does he reappear on the scene? Where does he reappear? No. No? No. Prior. Prior. He reappears with the baptism in the Jordan. Oh, That's yeah. where he shows back up mm -hmm. in the he historical was in the record. area. Mm -hmm. Right? And clearly he was on the move. Right. I mean, you could see this momentum starting to build. Mm. And then you can see the ministry is about to crack open. I mean, there's a static energy about to explode, right? The whole world. The whole just, world's about to explode, mm -hmm, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he gets... So the, it's like a climactic it is. rise. I like that. Mm -hmm. So he gets, you know, he, he has the baptism with John the Baptist, and John the Baptist says, this is the one who I'm not worthy to tie sandals, right? right. When Does Jesus go out and immediately start preaching? No. Mm -hmm. What does he do then? He goes into a proper period of fasting, discernment, prayer, discernment and fasting. And yeah. He goes to the Judean desert for 40 mm -hmm. days to be tempted by the devil. Well, didn't he tell some of the disciples to come and see? Mm -hmm. This is after. This after. is after. After that. So he went to be baptized in the Jordan. Then he went to the Judean desert, which is a harsh, harsh <coughs> Yeah. And he lived there for 40 days preparing himself. And that's a great example. Mm -hmm. You've lived in this sweet solitude of life with your family. And then... Joseph is probably dead at this time, right? Mary's being taken care of in Nazareth. You go down and you have your baptism with John the Baptist, and you go into the desert to prepare, mm. tempted by the devil, being offered the whole world if you'll just bow down and worship Satan. Yeah. And, and Jesus knowing the Maccabean revolt, Jesus knowing the prophecies of Isaiah right. and Ezekiel, knowing, you know, knowing Moses. Knowing where, where his path is leading him to. Exactly. Knowing Moses leading the children of Israel into the promised land, mm -hmm. the, humanly speaking, you know, mm -hmm. in his divinity, you know, everything's just being filled in mm -hmm. to his humanity. And he's experiencing it firsthand, literally firsthand in these places, you know, mm -hmm. I, how awesome. And But it's still kind of cool. silent, still kind of hidden. Still it's hidden. that, but it's now it seems hidden with a purpose. So that's why it shows up in the gospels. Mm -hmm. You know, he's hidden in the desert, preparing himself for the ministry. And then from Bethany in the Jordan to the, Gal to the Judean desert, he then, the gospels say, returns to Galilee, and that's when his ministry starts in mm -hmm. earnest. And then the whole story of the whole world and the gates of hell are blow up. Yeah. I mean, it's so kinetic. It's so powerful yeah. just considering this quiet, calm, peaceful storm, and then it, it explodes mm -hmm. in this torrent of grace and God's salvific mercy. It's, it's, it's only a few years, too. It's three yeah. years. His ministry. Three years. Yeah. I mean, presidents can't even get mm -hmm. anything done for, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, and if everything were to be contained in writing of what Jesus has done, in those three years, you know, like yeah. John, you know, the beloved yeah. said, yeah. I mean, j j there's no amount of, of scrolls that could contain what Jesus yeah. has done from mm -hmm. his adolescence the, through the hidden years, even in his public ministries of th three years, you, you can't contain everything that he did. Mm -hmm. What a what a beautiful show. This was very inspiring to me personally. We hope that it was very inspiring to you. And hopefully a few of the secrets were unlocked and what was hidden came to light. And as we continue to meditate on the beauty of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and his public ministry, and the fact that God humbled himself and entered into human flesh in the incarnation, in the person of Jesus, in the Holy Land, in a particular region, and that Jesus nomadically would have traveled about to encounter humanity in all of its different forms and all of its different nations. Uh, what, a, what a great show to meditate on. And we hope that you were inspired as well as us and, and keep on praying for us as we pray for you. And we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.